coffee, bears, salsa, and innovation, right now on Columbus Neighborhoods. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State auto insurance companies, serving customers and communities for nearly a century. Today, a technology and transformation company. Risk takers, creators, innovators. A company defined not by its history, but by its people. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation. Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated. It just needs to be right. CODA. Keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Mortine Marketing and Communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities and by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you. Food can sustain us, it's a cultural expression, and it can even bring back long forgotten memories. In this episode, we look at how food is more than just what's on your plate. It's the foundation for new ideas. Like a grocery store that was more than a place to pick up milk and eggs, it was an experience for the whole family. What I think I was so appreciative of Big Bear, it was a place where kids in the neighborhood could get a first job. They could start a little career. And that's me right there. I started off as a, when I was in high school as a bagger, carrying out groceries and so forth. I liked the business. I liked what I was doing. I stayed in the business and I left as the president and CEO of the company. There's nothing like a Big Bear hug. Wayne Brown was from a little small village in southern Ohio in Jackson County. Wayne Brown went to work for a grocery store company at the time, the Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company. Keep in mind that stores then, you, you didn't walk in and pick anything up. You walked up to a counter and you say, I want five pounds of flour and someone bagged it up. If you wanted some dried fruit, they opened a barrel and put it in. Brown had heard that there were people who were doing self-service stores where the, the products would be pre-packaged, ready to go. So he experimented with it and he did a store too, I'm not sure how many, for AMP and they got so angry with him that they told him to change him back because the people were going to steal you blind. He never really gave up on that idea. Came to Columbus, Ohio, found an old building on Lane Avenue and put the first self-service grocery store in the Midwest in there. And what Brown did is Brown had people down the basement, took 100 pound bags of flour, bagged it up, made five pound bags out of it, and then put them upstairs on their shelves for people to buy. Nobody had ever seen anything like that. It was, it was shocking. There's a lot of stories that say in the first three days, 200,000 people went to that store. The thing that I remember are these fantastic displays of canned goods, boxes of Wheaties or whatever it was that took up huge amounts of space, you know, we're over 10 feet tall, we're all precariously perched on each other, and they were the backdrop, what could have been every I Love Lucy sitcom, you know, where somebody accidentally bumps into it and everything goes sprawling. This store was 44,000 feet, so it was 10 times the size of a regular store. And in the store, it had a complete drugstore, had a pharmacist, had a sit-down restaurant, sold appliances. So Brown came up with this idea to have this bear in front of the store. And it is, he did tricks and a guy take care of him. He'd probably be flogged for doing that kind of thing today. So between the 30s and, and up through World War II, there wasn't a lot going on, but one by one, they would open more stores right in town. And then uh, they went to Lancaster, Ohio, and then they went over to Newark, Ohio, and then they went to Marion, Ohio. The big thing that Brown did, and he looked around and said, look, I'm, I'm not a very big company compared to Kroger and, and uh, AMP. And so they had their own brands of corn and peas and canned goods. So he said, 
how could I ever do that? I'm too small a company. So he was a smart enough guy that he got on the phone and he called other supermarket owners around the country because if they collectively got together, they could can enough peas, they could can enough corn, and, and over time that allowed him and guys his size then to be competitive with the big guys. That was a big thing, and that was in the late 40s that uh, that, that happened. Early 50s in central Ohio was the beginning of the shopping center boom. You know, town and country was the first shopping center in the United States. Big Bear had a store there, and, and as Don Casta built centers, the Big Bears popped up. In the mid-50s, about 55, when computers was a word that nobody knew what that was, IBM somehow selected Big Bear to put, a, a, the computer then was called a Raymac. And the idea was that the computer would help manage your business. It would control the inventory, it would do accounting. But years ago, you had these cards that you would take pencils and you would mark, a lot of us took exams and tests. Well, that's how the supermarkets would order their goods. Trading stamps became popular with people. It was kind of an inducement to get you to shop. So Brown formed a company called Buckeye Trading Stamps. When you bought groceries, you got uh, you know, one for every 10 cents or a dollar you shopped and you stuck them in the books. And then we opened up these redemption centers where you could go redeem those. And um, th there was one downtown at Spring and High, was down there for a number of years. The catalogs are so much fun to look through because it's not just little household things. There were pieces of furniture and there was even clothing that you could get. I know my first couple apartments were furnished by the premium stamps. I bought a mirror and I bought sheets and I bought other things from buying groceries. Brown built the first warehouse in the late 40s. It was a warehouse and in the front section was the offices. The grocery distribution warehouse was about 12 acres under one roof. You couldn't see from one end to the other, it was so big. But almost all of what we sold came out of there. Big Bear had its own trucks, its own fleet, its own... So it was an integrated uh, company that was um, uh, kind of a top to bottom. We, you know, we bought it here, we shipped it here, we shipped it out of here. Uh, you know, local people had jobs driving trucks and so forth. And, you know, they were so actively involved in the community for charitable things, whether that's supporting United Way or the Symphony or Ohio State University. The employees were always very proud of, of that and they treated the employees um, quite well and, and they stayed. I don't know if maybe Mr. Brown's health was failing, but he had decided to sell the company and he made a deal with an investment banking company from New York. Sometime in the 80s, they decided to make it a public company. Well, if you're a publicly traded company, then you're vulnerable to anybody who has enough money to go out and if you could buy enough stock, then, then you can own the company. So Gary Hirsch was an investment banker, 38 years old, not an old guy, had some partners, and decided that Big Bear was public and, and he would buy it. And there were a lot of these, they were called at the time leveraged buyouts, hostile takeovers that were occurring in the late 80s. They were all over the place. Aside from their original investments like Big Bear, and they just bought a lot of failed schlocky companies and with the idea that we're going to fix them and that doesn't happen very often so they got to the point at one time where they had borrowed like a billion four uh, they had 140 million dollars a year in interest payments to pay on those bonds as things became more desperate with the pen traffic people there was a panic there was always some new borderline illegal accounting scheme that you would do to try to make the numbers look better. I mean, it was always about numbers. It was never about the peaches and the corn and the clean floors and good service. Finally, whether it's a big company or an individual or you or I, you reach the point where you can't borrow any more money. And when you can't borrow any more money, then you have to begin to liquidate. They went through two bankruptcies. They went through one, I think, in 99 or 2000, and then the final one in 2003. I cringe for the employees at Big Bear that got hosed on their pension plans. And uh, those stories behind the scene things are ones that there are real people that uh, people who worked 25 and 30 years and thought they were going to get a nice pension. And, and because guys like Hirsch and those kind of people uh, had their way, they're, they're, they're comfortable someplace up in Rye, New York, while some cashier in Circleville, Ohio, is trying to figure out how she's going to retire now and those kind of things. They, they aggravate you. And uh, there's bodies all over the place in these kinds of things and th th there's never any bodies for the guys that do it. 
I think about what happened when Big Bear closed so abruptly. I think people were shocked, not just the employees, but the customers. Big Bear was just such a part of everybody's life. Let's say you have a great idea to make a new kind of peanut butter or a new recipe for salsa. How do you get your new creation out of your kitchen and into the hands of customers? Celebrate Local over in Easton is a shop that not only sells foodstuffs from local artisans, the founders support new food businesses from the ground up. Charlene Brown recently visited the owners of Celebrate Local to find out how they do it. We're at Easton Town Center at a shop called Celebrate Local and today we're making salsa. Peggy Hine Bellamy is a local artisan with her own unique recipe. In the early days, she made salsa just like this, cutting her own ingredients by hand. Her salsa was good enough to bring to a wider market, but like many small entrepreneurs, she needed some guidance on how to grow her business. Peggy, this salsa looks so delicious. <laughs> I just have to try it. There's lots of fresh vegetables in here. Mmm, mmm. Tell me, this is not the only version of salsa that you make, right? Right, I have four flavors. Okay, and just so that we know exactly what we're looking for when we come in here, what is the name of your brand? Well, the name of my company is A Bit of a Bite Salsa. And I guarantee you will take a whole lot more than a bite. Yes, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> this store, Celebrate Local, is, is a really interesting um, concept. Tell me how being here has helped your business grow. Coming into the store gave me the confidence of um, knowing that I can actually sell my product to other people than my family and friends. You really don't have a support system when you're a small business and I'm one person and knowing that Celebrate Local was kind of like my partner and every time I came in the store and did a demo or brought in product, I always felt like I was like the most important vendor in the store. And it also introduced me to a lot of other small businesses that were going through the same struggles that I was going through and like we all kind of help each other out. Do they actually give you guidance on um, production and marketing and all of that? Well, they have resources. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of organizations that you can reach out to as a new business owner. And Celebrate Local, they recommend it like ACDI, for example, and Ohio Proud, and like the SCORE organization. Those are all nonprofit organizations that help people that are starting their new business. And and really, if you have a question, they will find an answer. They will help the, the, your partner. They will help you find an area. How do I get bar codes or you know you know will this product sell do you think your customer needs this product and so that's one of the things I really enjoy about Celebrate Locals they're always thinking about you know what the customers want and if there's a need they'll go to one of the vendors and say hey do you think you could make this product mm. if um, you had to tell somebody else out there who has a product mm -hmm. that they wanted to sell what what advice would you give them what would you tell them to do well, they need to reach out to other small businesses because we are all in the same boat. We all really want to help each other. And that is one thing that I've found. It's been five years for me, and I've met so many amazing people. And, you know, when you think about the whole concept of Celebrate Local, and we have over 300 small families that we're supporting. We have a great Department of Agriculture, too. They have so much information. I learned a lot. And I would just randomly call them, and they were always willing to help me and answer questions. That's so, fantastic. Yeah. So there really is kind of a network. You just oh, need somebody is. to kind of point yes, you yes. in the right direction. And, and that's really what home. Celebrate Local does. We really can help them, guide them to those different nonprofits that will help you out, because you don't have a whole lot of money when you start out a business. And it sounds like you all become kind of a, a little family. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know a lot of them by name. I know their story. I know their families. And they come in the store and they drop off inventory. And you, you just take a few moments and visit with them and hear their story. And we're on the same journey. You know, we sure. want to do something that we love to do. And it's just nice knowing that there's a support system out there for you. What are the biggest sellers for Celebrate Local? Well, definitely one of the biggest sellers is our local honey. Um, that is, <laughs> yes, we sell a lot of local honey and local maple syrup. And anything that has a shape of Ohio, people love it. We have jewelry, we have woodworking items, we have t-shirts. Fans, you do oh, have yes. a lot of Buckeye We do stuff. have a lot of Buckeye in the Columbus store. Yes, a lot we do. of scarlet and gray. Yeah. <laughs> and that's definitely true. Vegetarian food is popular now. 
and there are a lot of vegetarian foods on the market, but that wasn't always the case. In 1939, Worthington Foods was one of the first manufacturers of vegetarian foods, and it has ties to Dr. Kellogg, the inventor of breakfast cereals. Remember this? Morning Star Farms continues to be a popular brand for vegetarians who crave a burger or a hot dog now and then. Worthington Foods is behind it all. It started out as Special Foods, a small manufacturing operation founded by Dr. George T. Harding II. You might recognize his brother there on the right. Dr. Harding was a devout member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, whose followers adhere to a strict vegetarian diet. Dr. Harding traveled to Battle Creek College and was trained by none other than Dr. John Harvey Kellogg. Before hundreds of breakfast cereals bore his name, Dr. Kellogg's clean diet-based therapy opened sanitariums and clinics all across the country. Our Dr. Harding came back to Columbus and treated patients with moderate psychiatric illnesses at the inpatient facility he founded, Harding Hospital. They had taken a position of, of emphasizing prevention of illness and well-being, and they emphasized uh, exercise, fresh air, water, uh, a diet that was rich with vegetables and fruits in a hospital setting that would give people a chance to, to recoup to uh, learn new ways of coping with life. So it grew out of the hospital's emphasis on healthful living. The signature product had been uh, chocolates, a gluten-based, wheat, wheat gluten-based uh, product. A fellow came along that uh, had uh, been a researcher for Henry Ford. And Henry Ford wanted to have all of his uh, components in his cars from products grown in America. And one of the things, he wanted a steering wheel. And the fellow that had that developed this, a synthetic uh, plastic that would make their steering wheels, said, you know, we've used vegetable protein to make this. If we stopped it at uh, step 30 instead of 50, maybe it would be an edible protein. And uh, rightly so it was. You're looking at a new and revolutionary concept in eating. Foods which can take the place of meat. Oh, oh, Friday again? And that same old question, what to do for a different Friday menu? Wait a minute. What's that new product Mary Jane tried last week? Raved about it, too. Quick, quick, white chick. That's it. Looks great. Now for the test. Do they like it? You bet they do. White Chick is great for sandwiches, too. Try it for your next Friday meal. White Chick, in the frozen food case at your favorite store, from Worthington Foods. At the time, Worthington was one of the largest, if not the largest, uh, producer of vegetarian protein foods. It was eventually sold to the Kellogg Company, who retained ownership until 2014. And if you want a taste of Worthington Foods, it's still around under many labels. One of them is Morningstar Farms. See all the delicious ways you can eat meatless with Morningstar Farms, and you may never eat meat again. Available in your grocer's frozen food section. Morningstar Farms, more ways to enjoy meatless. We love hearing from you through our Curious C-Bus portal. That's a place where you can ask questions and we'll answer them. Here's our latest question. How did Columbus get its reputation for being a food test market for the nation? Here's our expert, Ed Lentz, with the answer. Did you ever see a glamorous potato get fresh, making goo-goo eyes at you? No, well, Mr. Buckeye, so many captured them to make potato chips for you. Buckeye, potato Columbus, Ohio has been a test market for many years for a wide variety of products. It only formally became a test market in the years after World War II when modern testing techniques combined with modern communication allowed companies some distance away, 100 miles, 500 miles away, to run a test in a place like Columbus. People like Columbus because we're a diversified city. You can come to Columbus and find a test group for just about any product you have in mind. 
This was especially appealing to people who were forming new fast food franchises because they could essentially set up a restaurant or two in Columbus and find out if people really wanted whatever their product happened to be. So Columbus, for at least the last 50 to 60 years, has been a place that helps set the food tastes of the rest of America. That's what makes Columbus a very special place. Grabbing a cup of coffee has always been something to look forward to, whether it's to start the day or to take a break. In Franklinton, two Latino sisters have created a shop that serves more than good coffee. Their business is designed with a social initiative to decrease infant mortality rates in Franklinton. We are sisters, if you hadn't noticed. <laughs> we're sisters. A lot of times we get asked if we're twins. We're Venezuelan originally. Our family has been here for the past 20 years. We laugh mostly, which is the yeah. point. Yeah, we try to understand each other even more than ever in our lives just because we have so much at stake and we're doing everything now for our business and for our community. So less fighting, more having fun, more... No time to fight also. No time. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> So right now we're standing in our Open to the Public coffee shop and part of the proceeds from our coffee shop will go towards nonprofits that are working towards lowering infant mortality in the area and also different initiatives. And our co-working space, it's membership based. You can rent either a desk or a closed office space. You have availability a conference room, a kitchenette. And part of our terms of lease for our co-working space will be to do workforce development classes with Franklinson residents in the area. So really just promoting a mixed socioeconomic community and promoting people creating meaningful relationships. This was very important for us to be able to say that our coffee shop and co-working space with a social mission to reduce infant mortality could be in Franklinton because something some people might know, some people might not know, it's actually an infant mortality hotspot. But it's also the epicenter of one of the most amazing revitalizations, community revitalizations that I've ever experienced in my life. We knew that somehow, some way, we weren't sure how, Whatever type of business model we had was going to affect our community that is struggling in a positive way. So if you buy a coffee, okay, you're not necessarily doing direct service or social services, but every coffee you buy, part of it goes towards infant mortality. How many times can you say that you donate towards causes for infant mortality every day? Probably not a lot, but you buy coffee every day maybe. So it's kind of a way to engage people that normally wouldn't be engaged with our social issues. So the community health worker training program that I instruct with The Ohio State University College of Nursing is a really impactful new program and it's basically training community members um, through this course with the college, first for workforce development and second to be able to address social determinants of health in our community. What we're seeing with this program is that you see a social worker or a doctor or people that are working in social service agencies might not be able to connect with the person that's struggling because there's a trust issue. But if somebody else from the community were the for all of those services, then compliance would be different. And actually statistics do prove that the community health worker workers lower ER visits um, and that they actually ha help moms go to more prenatal visits. So statistically it's proven that it works. And what we're going to be doing is recruiting a Franklinson resident that will go through the 14-week training program with Ohio State College of Nursing um, community health worker training program and then they'll be placed here for a year doing outreach with pregnant moms in the area to connect them to services that are social services and seeing what is going on in their day-to-day -day, in their home life what's going on in their neighborhood that isn't letting them achieve that the, just the best health that they can to have healthy babies and healthy moms. It's been amazing, just everything that we've been able to accomplish with the support of the community, of our peers, just other young people kind of supporting what we're doing and being inspired and feeling like they can also make a difference. This is truly a lot bigger than us and we hope that it continues and it starts a movement so that it can empower other people as well. Even if we can affect one life with what we're doing here, then what we're doing was worth it. Thanks for being with us. And remember, you can catch all our episodes on ColumbusNeighborhoods.org. Plus, see our stories on the WSU mobile app. And you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods. I'm gonna get my
Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by. At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarter city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State auto insurance companies, serving customers and communities for nearly a century. Today, a technology and transformation company. Risk takers, creators, innovators. A company defined not by its history, but by its people. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation. Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated. It just needs to be right. CODA. Keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Mortine Marketing and Communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities and by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you.